Okay, we are live and we are recording now. So. Hello, Alicia. Can you hear me? Oh, no, she can't. Hmm. It's supposed to get cold tonight. I think a nice little storm, but it should be a nice weekend, especially for Mother's Day. Which will be nice. Hmm. Hi, Ian. Can you hear me? This is Alicia. I can. Can you hear me? Yes. My computer audio is not working, uh, even though I'm online on my computer. So I'm using my phone for just a minute, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to do something different here. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to use my computer, but I won't be able to talk to you because right now I'm using my phone and my computer to make this happen. Oh, okay. 
so you you may not want to ask me any questions because once okay. I <laughs> just FYI, I don't know why my audio is not working on my computer. I got it. I'm, I'm going to reboot it before we get started. Are we starting at twelve? Yeah, right at yeah. We'll start at twelve. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to go pretty much straight away to you know a quick welcome, and then I've got some backgrounds that Ty sent, and then we'll turn it over to them. Okay, so you can go ahead. Don't pay attention to me. I'm going to be over here troubleshooting. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs>
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, excited to uh, launch into our uh, webinar this afternoon. My name is Ian Marshall. I am uh, one of the tri, tri chairs as part of our HR uh, Richardson committee. And uh, part of that is uh, with RealPage. Uh, we've got a handful of other folks on our uh, panel as well. Uh, hopefully you're seeing that as, as well. You've got Alicia, most of you are probably familiar with these names, Alicia, Allison, myself. Uh, so glad to be part of this committee and, and thankful uh, that we are able to do this uh, new format. Not exactly what we thought we had signed up for, but we'll go virtual and be able to make this work uh, as well. Excited to have uh, a couple of guest speakers uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, with Ty Harmon and uh, Bill Link. I'm going to give you a little bit of background, just a little bit of logistics on the front end. Uh, you have the ability to ask questions uh, via the, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We're recording this for future use as well as there's some uh, follow-up details that we can send to the group uh, from a presentation standpoint. There's a lot of good stuff these guys are going to cover. I'm going to jump into it in a minute. We'll also have some time at the end for some Q&A, so we'll, we'll make sure to leave that open as well. Um, so just as we get into the, to the details of the, the presentation, let me give you a little bit of background about uh, Ty and Bill, uh, and it was more importantly, a little bit about their, their company. So uh, to the edge, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ty Harmon and Bill Link are, are from To the Edge, which is based here in Dallas. To the Edge mission is to help enterprises rapidly adapt to chaotic business environments by leveraging new capabilities. Uh, their agile testing and experimentation as a service, which I love this acronym, which is TEXAS, uh, methodology has helped organizations identify, test, and drive solutions for over 350 emerging uh, capabilities. What we're gonna hear today from To The Edge is what they do to help Fortune 200 clients develop approaches to responding to COVID-19 with innovative approaches and more importantly, their work to help understand, monitor, and implement HR approaches, which can allow employees the ability to adapt to a fluid and unsettling set of circumstances that we're currently dealing with. A little bit about Ty. Ty is the co-founder, I'm sorry, he's the founder and chief technology recon, I love these titles, for To The Edge, which is an innovation in emerging technology and consulting practice. Prior to launching To The Edge, Ty served as a technology fellow at AstraZeneca, establishing a global innovation uh, function to support intelligent pharmaceuticals and connect care solutions. Ty also spent eight years at Gartner, leading their innovation into emerging technology practices and supported over 500 global government and commercial enterprise efforts uh, to improve their innovation function and leveraging emerging technology. You're gonna find that both Ty and Bill are, are smart guys. So Ty is a former US Army uh, armor officer who served in a variety of leadership roles uh, on operational de deployments as an armor officer in the 464 Armor, graduating from the US Military Academy with a degree in economics. Bill Link uh, has been both an HR practitioner and consultant at global organizations, including CMO. CMOC, International Partner, Solitron, and MCI. His expertise is in large-scale digital transformation initiatives, HRIS deployments, organizational design, as well as strategic total reward systems, business process improvement, and competency and job family modeling. He has written over 100 articles on a variety of topics from disruptive innovation to history's greatest adaptive reuse projects. Bill has a bachelor's uh, degree in history from the University of Illinois, a JD from the University of Illinois Chicago John Marshall Law School, and is an associate professor uh, of business management at a major university for close to 20 years. Uh, guys, impressive background. Can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, for everybody on the call, Ty and Bill are going to take us through this. They'll then close us out because they've got a ton of great stuff. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them at the bottom. Without further ado, Ty, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ian. And also Alicia and Allison, thank you for the opportunity as well as Tech Titans. Uh, one thing that Ian, uh, I did not tell Ian to mention is I am the last standing tri-chair 
for the innovation group within Tech Titans. So as a recruitment video, if anyone would like to participate in the Tech Titans innovation group, uh, we would love to help you and I would certainly welcome uh, that support as well. So it's great to kind of have this particular focus of presentation. Uh, again, we did this uh, very similar for the innovation group a little over uh, almost a month ago. And now we're kind of putting a very specific HR kind of wrapper around this. And as Ian indicated, what we're going to get into today is what we're doing with our clients to actually to mitigate these risks from COVID-19 and more appropriately, how do you prepare your workplace for what's coming next? And how is this going to imp impact the way you conduct business, the way you deliver products? services or the, in fact, the entire business model that you may, in fact, be delivering today. Um, as we go through this, we're going to be providing a set of, obviously, recommendations. This is a very fluid element. We're, we're adding new content almost daily, as we all know, as this situation changes. Uh, but as we get into this, we, we ask for questions. Bill and I will be tag teaming, monitoring the Q&A. Uh, as we go through this, we hope that this is the beginning of a discussion that will really help all the tech titans, Richardson Chamber of Commerce, uh, kind of associates and members to really help drive value and help more importantly, every employee to migrate and to be able to mitigate some of their concerns uh, that are stemming from COVID-19. I think it's important to understand that this little virus is having tremendous ripples and implications across our society, our government and our business, and frankly, the way we live in this society. And it's important to understand that there are some key assumptions that organizations sh should be leveraging as they kind of evaluate how this is going to impact their organization. Some of you in emergency management mode where you're simply trying to keep the lights on, pay the rent, make payroll. Um, others are stable and they're starting to emerge from emergency response procedures and beginning to think about the longer term, more maybe intermediate implications to COVID-19. And quite candidly, there are some people perhaps on this call and in this market that they're, they're growing. This is, this is a growth area because of COVID-19 and therefore they're in a different kind of place that you have today. So some of the key assumptions that we're uh, providing for our clients, and this is obviously collaborative with very large organizations uh, as we do this collectively with them, is that We've been watching infectious diseases emerge on a really a schedule of every four years or so. Some have small implications, mirrors, uh, stars, larger implications, uh, but we're seeing something emerge every four years for roughly about the last decade. COVID-19, we you know it's a very fluid situation. There could be waves of COVID-19 with the mutation of the virus. We modeled this somewhat after Spanish flu, uh, which really had three waves between the spring of 1918 and the winter of 1919, and obviously a catastrophic uh, Im Im impacts and, and mortality associated with the Spanish flu. Um, I think all of us recognize that extreme social distancing, we, we characterize that very specifically because we recognize that social distancing is a critical mitigating factor to COVID-19, uh, but extreme social distancing uh, will equal economic disaster. Uh, we've seen that, we have some data that supports that, and I think we all finally recognize that health and wellness are becoming national security issues, uh, and that includes everything from where we get our our, our drugs and our pharmaceuticals, uh, all the way to is where do we manufacture um, certain PPE equipment and other things as well. Now, the immediate impacts that we're already seeing within this marketplace currently, um, we can see these on the screen, remote work, telehealth, just to kind of, again, I think this is a statistic that highlights how telehealth has changed. Um, Novant Hospital, who's publicly disclosed this, as well as Houston Methodist has also disclosed this, is that over a 12 month period prior to COVID-19, they did 1,000 telehealth visits total for a 12 month period. Uh, vast majority of those were in the mental health domain. That was where those telehealth visits were conducted. In a two week period, Novant Health did 30,000 telehealth visits. And just to give you a sense of in the healthcare market, the only thing that is keeping many hospitals afloat at this point is telehealth because elective surgeries and other types of traditional visits uh, that insurance obviously pays for. Um, those things have been suspended in many parts of the country and just now or we're starting to get some of these elective procedures back. Um, I have two kids that are in elementary school, you know, second grade and in fifth grade. 
Uh, many people may have teachers and other kids. We've all experienced what remote learning means. Uh, I joke that the open office concept at my house is failing miserably with all the devices that my kids are on and all the conference calls and video chats they're on. The open office is not working. So we're moving to closed offices in my house specifically for that. And then of course, electronic commerce. We know that grocery stores specifically were less than around 10% depending upon the data you read. That's fundamentally changed. Now, what are the possible, possible emerging ripples that are coming out? We're talking about track and trace or contact and trace and mass biosurveillance. Uh, the best way to really think about that is the Trusted Traveler Program and TSA that was implemented after September 11th as a proxy or an exemplar for what we may be experiencing in the future. But there's a lot of work in this kind of mass biosurveillance. We're going to talk a little bit about that and some of the technologies that are being implemented for health and wellness. Uh, we talked about supply chain resiliency. Uh, this is basically understanding where we make stuff, where we get stuff, and if those people like us or not. Uh, or they have their own agendas and geopolitical goals that may conflict with the goals here in the United States or uh, other places in the, in the world that uh, each of you may be doing operations. So supply chain resiliency is becoming quite critical. Uh, we see that especially in the way we process food in this country. We saw that Tyson's is just now opening up uh, one of their major processing facilities for pork up in Iowa. And that was after over 40% of the actual workforce had COVID-19. So uh, some of our food and supply chain has been going to resiliency. Uh, the healthcare revolution, we're seeing that, we'll talk about this. And the difference between a pork processing facility and a toilet paper facility is the degree of automation that was provided within those two areas. And so toilet paper obviously had social distancing in the manufacturing process, specifically because they had implemented robotic systems and other types of automated manufacturing systems where how you process uh, pork products, chicken products, beef products, that's a highly labor intensive purpose, close proximity to each other in terms of that operations. And lastly, I think we all have seen the, the cartoon which says, what is driven your digital transformation? Is it your CIO? Is it your CEO? Is it your CDO? And no, the answer is it's COVID-19. So this is what's requiring most organizations to obviously you know, deal with the emergency in front of them, kind of stabilize and then reemerge from that process. And so, Part of today's discussion is how are you adapting first to survive and then ultimately how will you adapt to thrive in this new reality that is emerging on a daily basis in front of us. So these are some of the things that uh, or areas in, in kind of key assumptions that we're looking at as we continue to move forward and trying to chart a path in conjunction with our clients uh, to how they're going to respond to what COVID-19 is changing in front of our eyes. Now, we know that there's been tremendous impact and catastrophic impact to certain industries associated with COVID-19. So this is from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics that talks about survey data from April the 3rd of this year. This is obviously, we have weekly unemployment reports. I believe the last number was somewhere in the order of 3.1 or 3.2 million unemployment claims uh, for this week. And so you see that uh, tremendous implications, but I do want to call out here as we look at this, just think about the implications to the healthcare industry. We think healthcare is a safe and stable industry, but we're talking on order of magnitude of hundreds of thousands of family practices across the United States, uh, basically becoming insolvent because of the fact that they cannot perform any procedures, pediatricians, ENTs, dentists, optometrists, all those types of practices, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, other types of skilled healthcare labor are getting laid off at an increasing rate as well because they can't perform those procedures as well. So even the healthcare system is not necessarily protected uh, from COVID-19 because of that. I think the other thing is understanding the implications to different populations within the United States. Uh, and this again is coming from uh, Pew Research from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics again. And again, we'll make all this available for people as well because we believe that each organization needs to evaluate and understand the source data to understand the implications to your specific business as well. And so you can see the age, uh, the gender, as well as the ethnicity of the individuals and the implications it's having as well. We know that many of the jobs uh, that 
several of us have in terms of being able to work remotely and being able to support that haven't been impacted to the degree of other positions uh, like uh, waitresses and wait staff uh, in restaurant type of businesses as well. And so there are tremendous implications that we have in front of us. And so the question is, how do we move forward? And that's really what today's presentation is about. So the last one that I have is uh, part of our scenario planning process is looking at more than just technology trends, but societal trends, in this case, infectious diseases or catastrophic events, if you're in the insurance industry, and thinking through how all these things interact with each other. And what we will want to make sure, and before we jump off into the HR portion that Bill will be covering today, is just a level set that there are an inflection curve, which we don't know clearly yet which direction we may go. And in some cases, as we continue to learn data and there's global studies uh, that are going through the scientific community, even those studies are being you know, vetted, they're being argued, they're being debated and deliberated. But what we are understanding is there may have a relatively quick recovery. That means that the mortality rate of COVID-19 is probably less than what we initially thought. Doesn't mean that it's not highly infectious. It's just reference the mortality rate. Uh, or it's going to be more akin to the Spanish flu, which could, uh, historical documentation says, may have you know, impacted 50 million people, right? That's a, that's a order of magnitude in terms of approaches. And so as we look at this, you know, it's very important that each organization evaluates the data that is being uh, developed and watching the different data, uh, the studies that are being reported, because as we get into the next set of discussions, there's going to be some things that you may implement as an HR policy that are common sense and that you would do regardless if this is going to be a quick return or more normal or it's going to fundamentally and in some cases perhaps even catastrophically change the nature of our society, then that's another step that you should take. But it's important to understand that there may be a couple different potential outcomes that may emerge from this, especially over the next three to six months. And so we want to point that out, that the data that everyone is looking at, which is effectively uh, the numerator and the denominator of the number of people infected in the mortality rate, and obviously the characteristics of that mortality rate, are going to guide pol pol uh, policy uh, makers, they're going to guide uh, policy experts in the healthcare space and government officials to guide, but it's also going to guide how we as individual organizations manage our employees, our customers, our suppliers, uh, and also the relationships that we establish. And there's obviously a potential risk uh, to fundamentally change the way uh, we act as human beings within the workplace, how our workplaces are designed. And so it's important to just have a level set of the data that is emerging on a daily basis uh, as you guide some of these decisions, because that will influence kind of the direction that you may go. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Bill Link, who's gonna take you through kind of the evolving employer-employee relationship. Bill. Great, thanks so much, Ty. Um, so in exploring some of the HR ramifications of COVID in these two uh, scenarios that we're faced with at our inflection point, I think one of the first realizations that we have from an HR perspective is what COVID-19 is really doing is evolving fitness for work requirements uh, from traditional notions, some of which we've listed here like lift and load abilities, drug, alcohol, and tobacco restrictions, uh, those sorts of things to physical health in the workplace. Uh, so uh, COVID is, is really um, expanding and evolving um, our notions of what uh, fitness for work really means. So on the next slide, um, we want to explore scenario number one, which is a relatively quick return to normal um, in contemplating a, a relatively quick restart as well. Um, despite the fact that um, this scenario imagines a relatively quick return to normal, um, that doesn't mean that the transition to the way we were is going to be smooth. 
So there are some uh, immediate people slash HR considerations uh, that are beginning to surface here, uh, many of which will be decided either through legislation uh, or litigation or perhaps both. Uh, so let's take just a closer look at some of these here. By the way, uh, at the end of the presentation, the slide deck and a um, comprehensive notes uh, document will be made available to you. There are many resources there and uh, further explanations of some of the points that we've talked about. Uh, it'll take a much deeper dive uh, into the topics than we have uh, time for today. But at any rate, let's hit some of the critical ones. Um, first off, let's talk about uh, temperature checks that are going on now. Um, one of the biggest ahas that HR people probably are having in this um, situation uh, is the applicability of the Americans with Disability, uh, Disabilities Act. So a question that you might have is that if ADA applies to uh, disabled people, why are we talking about it in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? And the answer to that is that uh, medical testing under the ADA applies to everyone, whether they are disabled or not. The ADA actually uh, defines, um, it, it doesn't define what a medical examination is, but it does present a test uh, for how uh, organizations can determine whether uh, what they are doing qualifies as a medical examination. Um, and if you look at those tests, and again, we'll include those in the notes uh, that will accompany the presentation deck, there are things like, um, does the test or procedure um, encompass a uh, physical and mental abilities or impairments? Um, does the test or procedure occur in a medical setting? Uh, does a healthcare professional interpret the results? And there are several others. So at first glance, um, you might conclude that temperature checks um, are not uh, medical examinations uh, under this definition uh, and probably should not be occurring. Um, Contrary to that position, the EEOC has ruled for purposes of pandemics that temperature checks do qualify as a medical examination. However, it's really not clear that the courts will take this position going forward because there are at least four uh, tests for medical examination that uh, these current uh, temperature checks uh, cannot meet. Um, so, other things related to these medical exams that are going on, i.e. mostly temperature checks uh, of employees, um, include some privacy considerations. Um, so imagine a person standing in line waiting to be tested, uh, and the test result is that the person has a fever. Uh, a likely scenario is that that person will be sent home and people in line um, would witness that and presume that that person uh, is either infected with COVID or at least has a fever. So, um, you know, this wouldn't be a violation of HIPAA per se, but the person could have a claim under ADA for public disclosure of a private fact. Uh, litigation in some states around this is already beginning, by the way. Um, there are also some considerations about union employees. Um, so there are cases uh, where the National Labor Relations Board uh, has ruled that safety rules are not the same as work rules, so that a management rights clause and a collective bargaining agreement may not be adequate to allow employee testing. Uh, so check with your uh, legal counsel if you employ uh, union employees and you are testing them um, because uh, union permission may be needed. Um, and then we have the situation where some employees will refuse to be tested on privacy grounds. Um, 
So, and this could apply to union employees or not, uh, under the NLRA, these people may be regarded uh, as engaging in a protected activity. Uh, so while the employer doesn't need to, uh, to pay these folks who are objecting to testing, um, they can't be disciplined uh, or terminated either. All right, um, as we move along uh, to the next slide, um, we have some additional things here uh, to consider. And along with the uh, temperature checks that are going on, um, we have the question of payment for non-exempt employees who are waiting in line for a temperature check, right? So on the one hand, uh, they are required to do this as part of their work responsibilities, but on the other hand, they're not actually working. Uh, I suspect that the ruling will be that uh, non-exempt employees will be paid for their time as they're waiting in line for these uh, temperature checks. Um, another thing that uh, likely will happen uh, because we are going through a um, sort of segmented startup is that organizations will need to do some demand and capacity planning. Um, they'll need to um, take a look at the spacing of workstations for social distancing, uh, office sterilization procedures, and uh, accommodations for people at higher risk of the infection. Um, and a new piece of legislation that has arisen in this scenario is the Families First Covirus Response Act. Um, so as you probably know, if you're an HR professional, um, this act has expanded the coverage of FMLA um, and there are certain uh, conditions here that I have uh, listed for you. Um, I believe Ohio had the first uh, case of an employee who refused to return to work. So none of these conditions under Families First applied to this particular woman. Uh, she was called back to work, but she refused, um, indicating that she had a fear of contracting the virus in the workplace uh, and didn't feel safe or comfortable going back to work. So questions uh, around that scenario will be whether um, the employee who refuses in this situation can continue to collect unemployment benefits and then um, how the employer will respond. Will the person be terminated uh, or will the organization provide uh, this uh, employee with additional time? Um, things that employers have to consider uh, are the blowback from making a decision to terminate uh, the employee. And that can come on many levels. Um, employees in the organization who hear about this, um, you know, media coverage of it, uh, the company's reputation uh, and so forth. So uh, things to think about there. All right, as we move along, <clears throat> other things to consider are policies for office visitors. Uh, what are we going to need from them? What information uh, would be required? Are we going to temperature check them as well? Um, and then in the scenario where uh, an employee returns to work and later becomes infected, uh, what disclosure notifications uh, will need to be made to others in the workforce? Um, and then if the organization has made some assertions that the workforce is uh, virus free or has been sterilized, uh, cleaned appropriately, uh, and nonetheless, someone uh, contracts the virus in the workplace, uh, what happens then? What is the liability for that? Um, and I'm sure um, as HR people, as you are contemplating a restart and return of people to the office or the return of more people to the office, you have to think about policies for the use of elevators and common areas like break rooms, kitchens, uh, all of that, and uh, the delivery of food into the office as well. And finally, mail distribution. How is that going to be handled? Is someone going to distribute 
the mail throughout the office or, or will people go to uh, a central mail room to pick it up, right? Um, and then there's the matter of social customs, right? Um, interestingly, uh, one of Britain's largest crematoriums has banned hugging and kissing at funerals. Uh, so we can contemplate a situation where um, this sort of social behavior outside of immediate family uh, might be criminalized. Um, and, um, you know, consequently, uh, that behavior in, in office scenarios uh, may uh, follow suit as well. Um, and then for our organizational development professionals out there, um, organizations need to think about employee state of mind uh, as they're going through this, whether they're in a telework environment or returning to work. Um, do they feel safe? Uh, what is going through their minds as, as we work our way through this? Uh, I think many organizations have already thought about that, and I know of a couple uh, that have already administered climate surveys and intend to um, continue doing that um, as, uh, as we progress through this. Okay, um, as we move along, we're going to consider the second scenario, and this imagines a longer recovery period um, and uh, a result um, that um, suggests a new normal, a permanent new normal. So in talking to lawyers and business leaders and a number of other people, um, we have compiled a list here of some fundamental changes that are fairly likely to occur uh, in this uh, longer term recovery scenario. Um, so it's not difficult to imagine that uh, people will lose some privacy rights. Um, you know, one of the primary ways that they could do that is through widespread use of uh, track and trace technology. Um, states are already beginning to consider this. In fact, Connecticut just announced a voluntary track and trace program that will monitor uh, movement of COVID-19 uh, COVID positive people using um, digital tracking technology. Uh, so um, the next question is, will this um, use of, of tracking technology become permanent uh, in our new normal world? Uh, drone policing of public uh, venues. Um, so Drones are in use in, in Russia now as uh, that country experiences a significant uptick in infections. Um, so they are policing for social distancing violations and uh, they are adamant and serious about fining people and even imprisoning people uh, for violations of, of those social distancing rules. Um, we can also imagine that disaster scenario planning will become a part of the organization's workforce plan and that surely will impact all of us who are in the human resources field. Um, one of the uh, forerunners of this has been Barrick Gold. Uh, they've had a disaster workforce plan for this virus in particular since early March, um, and they are planning to uh, develop a plan uh, on an ongoing basis for various forms of uh, disasters that uh, may impact uh, employees in the workplace. Um, Verizon is another good example of, of um, an early adopter. So uh, their plan called for a pivot of 110,000 of its 150,000 employees um, in 10 days to telework. So a remarkable and successful effort um, that they had uh, in implementing uh, telework. And then finally, uh, the New Zealand government um, is another exemplar here. <coughs> Pardon me. They've had a disaster telework plan in place since 2010. And if you recall, uh, New Zealand experienced a series of serious earthquakes uh, from 2010 to 2012. Uh, and this plan uh, enables government employees, all of them, 
to uh, pivot to home-based telework during disasters. Uh, let's turn our attention to HIPAA for a moment. Um, there are some temporary waivers in place um, because of the pandemic, um, and these waivers apply to some HIPAA provisions. Um, and these include things like um, the patient's um, uh, right to talk to speak, uh, I should, sorry, they include the requirement to obtain the patient's permission to uh, speak with family members and, and friends involved in the patient's care. That has been waived in light of the uh, pandemic. Um, uh, also waived uh, is the patient's um, desire to opt out of the healthcare facility directory. And there are several others here. Um, so in light of a new normal scenario, we can imagine that some of those waivers that are in place right now will become permanent in the new normal. Um, we can also anticipate amendments to the ADA that allow for more comprehensive and intrusive fitness testing. Um, immunity passports uh, for international travel. Several countries are exploring this option right now. In fact, Chile has begun issuing what the government calls a discharge certificates to, to travelers. So there is a little subtle difference between an immunity passport and a discharge certificate. Um, an immunity passport is something akin to a guarantee that a person um, is healthy uh, and will not uh, be able to infect people. Uh, a discharge certificate simply says the person had had the virus or the disease but has fully recovered. Um, there is not a, a guarantee there that um, you know the person could not infect others or become infected again. Uh, so in that, S, in, in that situation, Chile has recognized that uh, a negative test um, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily guarantee future immunity uh, and um, you know, an asymptomatic person is not necessarily one who is virus free. But we could get to the point when there are uh, vaccinations for uh, this virus and others that may crop up that uh, international travel at least would require uh, an immunity passport. And then clearly uh, business travel and, and uh, things like that will uh, lessen in favor of virtual meetings and trainings. As we move on, um, other things to consider are uh, training for employees, managers, and executives to be able to adapt to telework. Um, at the end of the deck, we've included some res uh, resources that you can check out for uh, telework training. Uh, many people are in that uh, telework mode now for the very first time, and it does take some adapting to that environment. Um, there will be uh, changing notions of employee productivity and performance man management and measurement if some of these positions become uh, permanently telework. Um, depending upon the flavor of the worker, uh, some people who are teleworking can be managed by uh, quality of work and hitting deadlines, others uh, may have different measures like number of phone calls uh, answered, response times to uh, various uh, customer situations and things like that. Um, companies will need to uh, evolve different strategies for motivating employees, especially those who uh, are in telework situations. Um, and retention strategies may need to evolve as well. Um, one thing that uh, COVID is uh, teaching us is that people who are in telework arrangements uh, and new to them um, have some psychological stressors. Uh, so for example, some recent studies have shown that video calls are more draining than live meetings uh, on people and introverts uh, who are on these calls are more susceptible to anxiety. 
Um, home workspace uh, safety and compliance uh, will be another area that uh, HR will need to focus on. Um, the state of California has had uh, uh, inspections for home workspaces and mandated that for several uh, years now. So uh, they may be in a, in a better position, a little ahead of the curve, but one can imagine that uh, workplace safety at home and compliance inspections will occur. Um, as well, the supply of office space um, will be greater uh, than uh, the demand. Uh, if there are uh, permanent teleworking positions, that will affect the real estate market uh, and there will be new designs uh, for the number of workspaces that will need to be reduced as a consequence of more telework. Um, organizations probably will be required to stock PPE in the workplace for just-in-case scenarios. Uh, and then from a taxation perspective, we can expect an increase in employers' unemployment tax contributions because of the risk of future pandemics. And then surely um, an increase in workers' compensation insurance and general liability premiums. Okay, um, as we move forward, uh, I'll turn this back over to Ty, who is going to cover some emerging technology solutions uh, and uh, bring us to a close of uh, the webinar today. Ty? Again, if you have Q&A, please submit it through that. We'll try to get to as many as we can. <laughs> Uh, but this plays on the notion of identification and password is core to what we have today within an organization. How does temperature and by extension wellness play our ability to access systems, access spaces to be able to do things? Uh, we have clients that are in the government space that have a secure compartmentalized information facilities or SCIFs. These are classified and above networks that still require people to go into the office. And so our earliest work in about two months ago was around looking at camera systems that would eliminate the close proximity to do a temporal scan or actual physical contact from some society in a security or access control position to allow for kind of a remote standoff, if you will, kind of scan. And so thermal scans, uh, there's a lot of thermal companies out there. Many of these companies uh, are moving into the COVID-19 space, either from a healthcare perspective or a camera perspective or a solution perspective. And many of these have what you can see in the uh, <clears throat> bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a grayed out image uh, that has a person's face with a little small uh, square, red square, but on the left-hand side, what you'll see is a marker, uh, basically a validation tool that says that the temperature is within this range. And so we're seeing these, as, as Bill indicated, there was work within the United States, drones and thermal cameras that was kind of stopped due to privacy concerns. Internationally, we see this as well. Uh, we know security camera companies that are implementing this today. Uh, but let's be very clear, it's a useful tool for detecting elevated body temperature. There could be many reasons for that. Uh, additionally, people could take uh, kind of suppression uh, medications to be able to lower their temperature. And we know that for COVID-19, you can be asymptomatic for up to 14 days uh, and, and a carrier of this disease, and these solutions would not help at all. So this is really finding kind of an immediate stopgap procedure for people that are clearly sick and have an elevated temperature in the workplace uh, to be able to identify them and to be able to track them as well. And so there's a, there's a lot of, as Bill said, there's a lot of variety and there's a lot of questions about the accuracy of this. And so we're having to do, as Bill indicated, a lot of what if scenarios based upon some of the things Bill talked about and how do we use this. However, you know, as an example, we talked about Tyson's pork processing plant in Iowa, went through two weeks of deep cleaning, they're doing thermal scans, right? This is a stopgap measure. In some cases, maybe it's a placebo to help employees feel safe that somebody with a temperature is not there. I think we all recognize that somebody could still be infectious in the workplace and not have a temperature. So where are most organizations beginning to move for, for in terms of the types of technologies that they're evaluating? Some of these are in research and development. Some are going through validation studies to make sure that what they're detecting from the sensor technology 
is in fact indicative of someone having an infection of some type, not necessarily COVID-19, but an infection of some type. So we had these kind of wellness survey applications, track and trace applications, or contact and trace applications that people are beginning to deploy uh, in a very large number of scale. And so the question here is, do I have to certify that I'm well before I leave my house? Does my car have like a DUI breathalyzer for the ignition control? Do I have to certify in my car before I get into the work? If I get to work, and I'm asymptomatic, but I have, uh, you know, I'm infected, it's too late at that point. That's just the reality. And so we look at this and say there's these wellness and contact and trace applications, but Tidal Care is a very interesting model. Tidal Care is one of these consumer grade, medically validated diagnostic tools that you can buy at Best Buy right now for $299. Tongue depressor, look in your ears, your nose, your throat, to listen to your heart. These are all tools that come in this adaptive uh, kind of kit that you have in both a clinical and as well as a consumer setting that establishes a secure connection either synchronously or asynchronously with a healthcare provider. Uh, now, I can't get into who is doing this, but uh, for self-insured folks, they are buying these for their employees and their employees are using these to certify their wellness for COVID-19 and be able to go into the office as well. So these are kind of these telehealth tools that are going to come out to play that fall into this remote diagnostic market. And we're already seeing organizations leverage solutions like this to validate the wellness of an employee. Sensors like BioIntelligence is an FDA approved patch, if you will, of IoT sensors that collects data over 30 days. There are many that are emerging in this space. There's actually work out of UC Berkeley that has a sweat monitor that replaces many of the panels that you would take from a blood and urine sample by analyzing your sweat, your sweat. So there's a lot of work that we're doing right now in this kind of distributed advanced sensor space that would allow for an organization or an individual more precisely to understand not their physiological health, but also um, their wellness in terms of an infection to be able to go into work. Now, these are critically important because we've identified and the data is beginning to emerge, if not has emerged, that comorbidity is one of the key causes for the high fatality rate that we have within, within the United States and globally. In one hospital of over 6,000 COVID-19 fatalities, 94% of those people succumbing to the disease had some form of comorbidity and those fall into the categories of hypertension, diabetes, uh, and other types of episode, um, chronic conditions, excuse me, that you need to monitor for. So the question now, especially for HR professionals, as well as those that are self-insured and have healthcare plans, does the pandemic cause higher rates for people that are in these at-risk categories because they can succumb to this? How does wellness factor into your overall rate structure as a company to and help people not only manage the mental burden that we've talked about, but also have a good sense of what they're doing in terms of protecting themselves the best they can from these types of things as well. Additionally, emerging research, the Israelis are looking at voice technology and investing in that to say, can I detect respiratory conditions from the way a person sounds with obviously a baseline score? And just this week, there are training dogs to detect COVID-19 that was announced. So lots of different approaches and techniques. Finally, wearables that don't have uh, temperature controls like Aura, that's the ring that you see in kind of the center left of the slide. There's a study right now in California with healthcare professionals, this tracks temperature. It'd be clear Fitbit and Apple do not, but with their rhythm strips that are embedded into those solutions, uh, they are doing uh, work right now to, to say, can we detect some sort of anomaly in the data from that rhythm strip that would be indicative of an infection. In fact, Plush Care, uh, who's kind of in this telehealth uh, concierge medicine space, just announced this morning a partnership for a large scale study with Fitbit uh, to be able to leverage this as well. So the question of your fitness program and your wellness program, that is evolving and extending in many organizations to be able to leverage tools such as these to be able to look at how people can leverage these, these reports, this data, in order to effectively manage their population as well. 
So we've covered a lot and we're gonna leave at least 10 minutes for questions and answers uh, that, we, that we may have from the group. But what are some of the considerations that we would recommend to all organizations to look at? So just understand that employee-employer relationships will definitely change and more importantly evolve. We talked about the initial ripple that was caused by COVID-19, the secondary effects, which is the economic implications and the public health crisis that we had, and then now we're gonna be looking in the legal because everything that happens right now is already under legal challenge. And that's gonna create another ripple that every organization has to deal with. The lawsuits are mounting. Uh, they're looking at legislation within the US Congress to mitigate or remove the liability associated with this in any future stimulus package. So it's a very fluid state about that employee-employee relationship. Uh, it's going to be clear that we all have a, a vested personal and moral obligation to protect the health and wellness of our employees and to continue business operations as best we can and contribute to the community stability by ensuring people are safe, that businesses stay open and operational, and more importantly, we, pr we protect life and liberty as long as the process. So you need to make sure that you are working with both your technology as well as your business partners around the value of employee health monitoring solutions, recognizing that there's going to be some limitations on privacy. Those will be mediated by some of the, the waivers that have happened now, but those things will evolve and change with the legal situation in the United States. I think it's critically important to communicate the purpose and intent and to monitor those legal challenges because that will affect you. So I think it's also not, you know, not remiss in saying that COVID-19 is a global infection, inflection point that's going to influence how we do business. So it's in critical to educate the leaders on the possible impacts. We've seen organizations go down a track of this is the worst case. There's nothing wrong with that, but a balanced view of understanding that there's a, a less than worst case scenario can fundamentally change some of your approaches to the questions as well as the solutions that we're looking at. Uh, looking at the regulatory framework, customer buying behavior change, this is going to impact your products and services. And understand that COVID-19 will create as much market and industry and social disruption as any other inflection point that we've seen in the last several years. And finally, you know, we want to make sure that everybody, you know, we talked about people being in different places in different spaces. But at some point, your organization is going to have to transition from emergency response to taking an active scenario planning model that takes in these triggers, these research trends, these regulatory, uh, the technology, the consumer buying behavior, a multitude of variables to understand how they interact for the, it's not just a single trend, it's usually multiple trends coming together that create both risk and opportunities for your organization. This is even more critical over the next 30 to 60 days as most organizations will continue to do their annual strategy and budget process that will prepare them for FY21. If you do that today, you then you can chart a very clear path to adapt and thrive in the world that's being created in front of us from COVID-19. And with that, we'll, we'll have our slide up with um, our names as well as our emails if there's any additional questions or follow-up, but I also wanna open it up to questions. All right, we have one question through the chat and you think there are more job opportunities for special needs individuals to work from, from home. I, there, there will be, I think, some fundamental shifts in how employees work and who goes back to the office nationwide. Just announced this week that only five locations, which happen to be their five largest physical offices, will be the only offices. Uh, that remain open and they'll continue to all work from home and so as we get into this new normal i can tell you that as, as a parent watching the educational as well as these types of exchanges as bill indicated that they don't fit the culture in the workplace for how we do collaboration sometimes we're going to see some fundamental changes in the collaboration tools that we have available to us out of this shared experience from education and a work perspective uh, Ty, just to add a couple of things to that, um, you know, organizations that are creating telework positions for the first time um, have to think about what competencies applicants for the position uh, will have. So uh, one of the things that we're doing now is helping organizations to develop um, behavioral interview questions and competencies 
specifically around the ability to telework. Uh, so I think that is going to be a, a consideration. And then as well, um, how do you manage in a telework environment? I can only imagine uh, the large number of managers out there whose workforces suddenly became virtual. Uh, it's just as important for managers to understand how to manage in that environment as it is for employees to learn how to adapt to it. Very good. Uh, just to kind of build on that as we're waiting for additional questions to come in, uh, we also see it as an opportunity because in a physical meeting, how hard is it to track notes? How difficult may it be to understand people's participation? When we're going through a digital channel, then by applying natural language processing, video analytics, computer vision capabilities, and then be able to streamline those, those uh, findings, those annotations of these types of you know, webinars that we're doing today, that may be an opportunity to capture more information uh, that comes with both risk as well as a change in culture. But there, we do have clients that are investing in NLP and computer vision to be able to do that within this new digital communication uh, meeting. Okay. We have time for a couple more questions if there are any others. Oh, we have a question coming in. Do you anticipate an increase in labor complaints, lawsuits filed by employees if employers do not implement particular safeguard policies related to this issue? Bill, do you wanna take that one? Sure, thanks Ty. Uh, indeed, uh, we're already seeing some of those now. Um, you know, I think a major consideration will be a balance if we end up in a new normal scenario, a balance between um, you know, our expectations for privacy rights, uh, given uh, the history in, in our country of trying to protect those things uh, versus what will be needed uh, for the greater public good. So, uh, you know, notions of privacy will be, you know, redefined clearly. Um, and, uh, you know, from that, there's going to be a learning curve and in, in most situations, learning curves involve litigation. Uh, so I think that um, there will be an uptick in employees uh, challenging this. Uh, it's already manifesting itself in the return to um, uh, work and the you know various governors uh, talking about plans to reopen. Uh, there's a strong contingent that wants this to move faster, and then other uh, governors that are putting the brakes on. For example, uh, the governor of uh, Washington State. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think we will. And, and just to build on that, there have already been 11,000 OSHA complaints as of earlier this week. And so there's many different ones on that. Uh, for Shannon, our host, we have a question through the Q&A feature. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot see that question. So if you'd be so kind to read it, we'll do our best to answer it. Okay, will we uh, see an increase in ADA, anxiety, migraines, and other uh, manifestations of this kind of crisis from a mental health perspective? I think so. Um, studies have already come out um, about uh, anxiety issues for introverts, uh, for example, who participate in, in teleconferences. Um, those studies have been around for a while. Um, and, you know, in uncertain times, um, I think there's just a natural tendency for people to be anxious. Um, you know, things are operating here like uh, the notion of um, cabin fever and people wanting to get out. Um, and, uh, you know, the anxiety of not being able to, to socialize with friends or family. Uh, all of that kind of thing will manifest itself. And if it becomes serious enough and people uh, turn to healthcare professionals uh, to get a diagnosis, then uh, I think, yes, uh, there will be an increase in, in uh, uh, anxiety symptoms that could lead to uh, ADA considerations. Okay. We well, thank you all. Uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour. And again, 
uh, here you see our contact information here at To The Edge or go through your, your HR uh, tri-chairs. And uh, if there's interesting topics, uh, we're planning on doing something about disinfections of workplaces and solutions around that as well. There are upcoming events uh, around Tech Titans for Track and Trace from NCT Data and then the future of telehealth as well on the schedule for May. So many more uh, opportunities to engage through Tech Titans um, and the Richardson Chamber of Commerce to understand some of these in, uh, kind of in, impacts and implications. And we look forward to speaking with everyone soon in the near future. Be safe out there, uh, continue to fight for your, for your employees. And uh, if there's any questions, please let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you.